Sorry, I thought I had done that. Okay, is it showing now? Yes, it is. Excellent. Okay, so actually that should be my first question to everybody. Can you see my screen? So uh, just type in yes. Excellent. And you can hear me just fine. Yeah, excellent. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that quick feedback. So I'll start over again, and that is to let you know this is presented by um, the East West School of Planetary Herbalism. I'm Leslie Tierra, and I'm going to be talking about tongue diagnosis and herbs today. Um, you all should be seeing this screen of beautiful tongues, three of them here. And uh, I hope nobody has a squeezy, queasy stomach because this is what we're going to be looking at all evening here for the next hour and a half. I suggest that you take a selfie of your tongue right now. Um, try to get in good light if you can, ideally not overhead light unless it's a halogen white light. Um, and try to stick it out far enough that the rear can be seen. As you can see this left tongue here, you can see the whole tongue. And um, sometimes there's a little yellowish cast, just a tiny bit here, not much on this middle picture. And um, so that's why if you don't have a camera where you can do a selfie, then get a mirror and a flashlight. That way you'll be able to look at your tongue while we're talking about this and start figuring out for yourself what's going on in your own body. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here um, and just talk about how, first of all, tongue diagnosis has been used for a long time in China. Um, it dates back to 1341 at least um, in a book that was written and that book was actually based in part on another book. So we don't really know how old it is, but it's many hundreds of years old and as well it's been used in traditional Ayurvedic medicine. I'm sure many other traditional medicines around the world have used tongue diagnosis. It's certainly been used in the West, in Greece, <clears throat> with the Greek humor system and continued up through the 1900s. I actually remember as a young child going to the doctor um, in the 1900s. Boy, that sounds old, doesn't it? <laughs> and um, being asked to see my tongue, have me stick out my tongue, the old good old ah with the tongue depressor. And um, at that point, they were doctors were actually looking at more than just your tonsils in your throat. They were looking at the tongue. Um, as well, but it's really lost uh, usage so uh, in Western medicine at this point. So I want to give everybody just a second here to get your pictures taken because um, I really want to dive in and I'm uh, concerned about going too fast. Um, anybody have, will you be, here's somebody who's got a question, I will answer that. Will we be able to download the slides at some point? And no, not that I know of, but we are recording this and we will put this up on our website with our archives and there will be a way that you'll be able to see the recording afterwards. So you'll be able to take a look at the tongues at your leisure. And I was going to say this at the end, but I'll say this now as well. I highly recommend that after you finish this class tonight, you start looking at everybody's tongues and taking a ton of pictures. Pictures are fabulous, especially with the cell phones we have now. You don't have to wait to develop it and all that. You can look at it right away. You can zoom in so you can really see the tongue very clearly and start getting ideas of different patterns on the tongue that you're going to learn today. So take lots of pictures, just strangers, anybody, just photograph their tongue and um, get used to it as, um, because the more practice you get, the better you will get, the more this will really come to you. So why do tongue diagnosis in the first place? You know, it did lose favor in Western medicine, so why do we keep doing it in other medicines? Well, I have to say that tongue di diagnosis is one of my very favorite 
methods of diagnosis. Even after you listen to somebody um, share all their signs and symptoms with you, they may not be telling you everything that they're experiencing. But if you look at the tongue, you can really tell right off the bat, for the most part, what is going on with somebody in their bodies. And unlike the pulse, it doesn't change nearly so fast. If somebody's having an emotional, um, an emotion all of a sudden run through their bodies or they just ran to the, the office to see you um, or just in that moment they can get upset about something, the pulse changes instantly. So the tongue does not change that quickly, so it's a little bit more dependable in that sense. Um, however, it does change enough that when you can, you can see over time uh, your progress with treatment or if there is no treatment, how the tongue is progressing in the other direction. So it really can reveal a lot and, uh, and you can count on it. So um, as I said, regardless of what the patient shares or doesn't, the tongue gives you a good reflection of what's going on in the body. And as well, it helps you see what's developing in the body. In the ancient days, the um, physician to the emperor was not paid if the emperor was sick. It wasn't like, you know, if we get sick, we go see the doctor, the acupuncturist, the herbalist, and get remedies. Instead, the, physician, the physician's job was to keep the emperor well. So it was always, uh, the, the physician was always looking at what is developing, what could potentially manifest in the emperor. And so giving daily soups, which uh, is the name for teas, what we would call teas, to counteract all these uh, potential imbalances and keep the emperor well. So we can look at somebody's tongue and we can see that, okay, they don't have this issue yet, thank heavens, but if they keep going like they're going, they're, they could develop this symptom, that symptom, and so forth. So it really is a good um, futuristic diagnostic inter indicator so you can do preventative medicine with them. And one thing I really want everybody to keep in mind here that's very important is that we're not treating diseases. So when we look at the tongue, we're looking at patterns of energy imbalances and we treat those patterns of energy imbalances. This has a tremendous advantage because a lot of diseases or conditions in Western medicine are quote unquote either incurable or they throw up their hands, they don't know what the problem is, or they tell you to go see a psychiatrist or a psychologist, usually a psychiatrist. In Chinese medicine, a lot of these strange symptoms actually form patterns. And when you treat the pattern, the symptoms go away. So that's another real definite advantage of doing this process of treatment. So I just want to say as we go on, that this class is for uh, anybody. It's not just for people who have had training in Chinese medicine. I'm really going to try to break the language down and so forth. So anyone who is just for the first time joining in can get this. And if you don't, go ahead and type in a question and uh, we'll try to catch it for you. So in traditional Chinese medicine, tongue diagnosis, we're looking at the tongue body, the coat, the moisture, the shape, and movement. And of all of these, the most important is the tongue body and the tongue coat. So the tongue body indicates the conditions of qi, which is, we're going to loosely define it as energy in the body. So the person's energy and that energy function with the organs, the blood, the state of their blood, the state of their fluids. By yin, we're going to uh, speak about yin in terms of the flesh in the body, the fluids, the muscles, the, um, the bones, all of the substantial parts of the body. And yang, we're speaking of an energetic, metabolic, fire metabolizing, energizing aspect of the body. And then what are called the yin organs, and the yin organs are the vital organs. Well, we can't live without the heart, lungs, liver, spleen, or kidneys. Well, we can the spleen, but it's considered one of the yin organs. And so the tongue body also shows long-term pathological disharmonies and weaknesses. So in other words, it's more uh, showing chronic conditions that occur in the body. And it's very reliable as an underlying, uh, giving the underlying pattern of disharmony. The um, tongue coat shows more acute conditions. It's the uppermost layer on the tongue. 
and it reflects the young organs of the body. So these are the hollow organs, the small intestine, large intestine, gallbladder, stomach, and urinary bladder. It also shows the location of the disharmony, and as I said, acute pathologies. So we're looking at the tongue thickness or thinness, which will reflect excess or deficient states. Excess meaning there's too much of something, deficient meaning there's not enough of something. And overall, of course, indicates dampness or dryness in the body. So just keep in mind the tongue can change within an hour and, um, and even over days and months, of course. But it could change within an hour. I've seen it with an acupuncture treatment. I've seen within a half hour the tongue change. So we look at the tongue as a map of the whole body. The whole body is reflected on the tongue. And um, different parts of the tongue correspond to different organs. The front of the tongue, or the anterior portion of the tongue, the tip going back a third, is the upper part of the body and the upper organs. So we've got the lungs in the front and the very tip is the heart. The middle of the body is the middle of the tongue. And in this case, it's including in the center, the spleen and stomach. On the very edges is the liver. And on top of the sides is the gallbladder. And then the rear of the tongue, or the posterior, represents all the organs in the lower part of the body. So we've got the large and small intestines, the urinary bladder, uterus, and at the very root, the kidneys. So the sides of the tongue can also be divided up, even though they represent the liver. The front sides indicates also the chest area, the lungs, the heart, and the breasts. The middle sides, the spleen, and the rear sides, the intestines. And here's a map of that. So I'm going to just stall here for a second. Maybe you can all just draw a really quick um, diagram of this for yourselves. So you really get an idea of what organs are where. Because as we go through these tongue sides slides, you're going to be seeing these um, coats, tongue coats in specific areas. And you want to be able to identify them. And then also other qualities that we're going to discuss. So the heart. Um, is the tip, I would actually move that, if I were to draw that diagram today, I would move it a little bit closer to the actual tip of the tongue. It's uh, taking up a little bit too much um, of that forward or um, anterior portion of the tongue. So you see how the liver is actually the very edges and the gallbladder is on the top and the edges. You have to kind of um, use your graphic imagination about that liver being the sides and um, the gallbladder the top sides. Okay, so inspecting the tongue. Now, this is really key because when you're inspecting the tongue, you want to make sure that you have a good quality light on it. If you use a typical flashlight, it has a yellow cast to it and it will create a sort of yellowish look to the tongue, which might make you think that there's a yellow coat or yellowness which has a particular reason um, indication to it so um, or if you have a very cold light a bluish light it could make the tongue look bluish purplish we want to separate all that out so ideally you have a halogen light that would be um, pure white and really give you accurate reading um, sunlight works but I would not take pictures directly in the sun, I would do it in the shade because the sun is too contrasty and you'll get shadows on the rear of the tongue. You won't be able to see it. If you're in the shade, you'll get a good quality full spectrum light and can see the whole tongue. So you want the person to stick their tongue out moderately far, not too far, or else the shape and the color are distorted. And if you do it too little, it's hard to assess, obviously. You won't be able to see it. Sometimes I tell people to say, ah, because they're used to that. Um, a lot of people are still from the doctors um, and you can get a pretty good look at the the whole tongue doing that. Now when you're assessing the tongue there's a lot of things to look for and the longer somebody takes, sticks their tongue out the darker it gets so you don't want them to have it out any more than 15 seconds max at a time. So what I'll do um, and it will change shape actually at that point as well. So I'll have somebody stick their tongue out for five to ten seconds and then stick it back in. I'll write down what I see and then have them stick it out again knowing I'm looking for other things. I might have them do that four or five times. So um, 
no problem doing that. You just want to make sure you're getting as accurate a reading as possible. And then write down what you see in terms of tongue body, shape and color, and the coat thickness, color, and moisture. Now, of course, we have to be able to distinguish between whatever may have influenced the tongue, like residue of food, um, certain things will color it, be it strawberries, chocolate, lozenges, all those kind of things. So if you see an odd color, ask them if they just ate something to help to distinguish that. Okay, so this is what to observe. The overall appearance of the tongue, does it have spirit? In other words, does it have energy? Is it just lying there flaccid and drooping in the tongue? Or is it stiff? Or does it have good energy to it? The body color, Sublingual veins are on underneath the body of the tongue. You tell the person to stick, to touch the roof of their mouths with their tongue, the tip of the tongue, and you'll be able to look underneath. So we want to look at those as well. And then, of course, any coating on the tongue. Then we're going to look at any tongue moisture. Is it wet? Is it dry? And then various shapes of the tongue. And there's lots of different shapes with different meanings. Um, is there any movement of the tongue? Does it shake? Does it tremble? Does it deviate, uh, stick out to one side or another, or is it stiff? And then, of course, we're going to be looking at different areas of the tongue, like the center or the rear or the sides, the top sides, the front, the tip. So it's good to start with by looking at what the heck is a normal tongue. What does a normal tongue look like? Well, like many things, it's neither too long nor too short. It's not too thick or too thin. It's not too red or too pale. So it's pale pink, pale red or pink in color. This is a really nice looking tongue. You don't see too many of these. It's, um, it has spirit. You know, there's a little, a little moisture to it, but not too much. It's not cracked or creviced. Um, there's a thin white coat on it that's totally normal. Um, there are no sublingual veins, which we're not seeing here, of course, but um, just assume there aren't any. And um, everything is in balance. So in this case, you assume that all the organs are functioning well and the digestion particularly is functioning uh, harmoniously. So we're going to start with the tongue body color. Now I'm dividing this webinar into two because I purposely don't want to go too fast. And so this is part one. We're going to cover the tongue body color and coat. Um, in part two, we'll get into the tongue body shape and movement. Now, there's a lot you can get just from the tongue body color and the coat. So this, as I said before, it indicates the condition of the organs, the yin organs, and the chi blood fluids and yin and yang of the whole body. So that's what we're going to look at first. This is a pale tongue. Now I'm going to just show you real quickly since we're so close. See this is pale red, pink. This is pale. See the difference? So pale means several possibilities. It could be either if there's a normal shape, shape and coat, it would mean there's not enough energy in the body. This could translate into things like tiredness, weakness or lack of appetite, um, uh, low immunity to colds and flus, um, frequent urination, just the, the energy is weak. It's not holding um, and it's not uh, metabolizing well. If it's also thin, so if the tongue is pale and thin, it means there's not enough blood. So blood is one of the fluids of the body and fluids help give substance. Um, if there's not enough fluids, then you're going to have thinness. You have less substance to fill out the flesh, to make it plump. And um, so it's going to be thin. If it's swollen, if it's pale and swollen, that means there's actually coldness in the body. We call it deficient yang because yang is that metabolic heat. And so we're, we have coldness, meaning there's not enough heat or metabolic fires in the body to metabolize fluids so they collect and swell the tongue. Now if it's a pale tongue and it's um, a bit, um, it may or may not be a bit swollen but um, it's not too thin or too thick as this one is, then you have symptoms of, like I said, low energy, lethargy, could be shortness of breath, low metabolism, frequent colds and flus, frequent urination, soft voice, 
all of these sorts of things. Um, I won't be lay, staying on each of these sites long enough for you to write all of this stuff down. I'm giving you a heads up, but you can see the show afterwards. It's being recorded and spend your time with it at that point. So in this case, we want to use herbs that actually tonify chi, that build the energy in the body. This is one of those um, categories of herbs that there is really no Western counterpart. We are starting to get, um, we do of course have adaptogens and restoratives in Chinese medicine and some of these do tonify qi but they're not always strong enough for what's needed so I do include some Chinese herbs here in this case. Um, Chinese ginseng, very major herb for strengthening energy in the body. Katanopsis, another Chinese herb that strengthens energy. It's like a poor man's ginseng in a way. Jujube dates are those Chinese red dates and people are growing them here in the States. They tonify energy and blood. A lot of people know about astragalus for immunity. Um, Chinese wild yam, not the Western or Ameri not the Western wild yam, but the Chinese. Um, reishi, a lot of people know and use reishi already. Eleuthero, now many people know eleuthero and that tonifies um, qi, particularly of the kidneys. Rhodiola, same thing. Mar um, marrow root, um, that should be an A, M A R A L root, tonifies chi, suma, a lot of people know that from South America, and also honey and barley malt. Small amounts of a whole sugar can also strengthen energy. Now, if it's pale and thin, we need to build blood. And in this case, we're going to take a different approach. Um, in Western herbalism, to build blood typically means to use quote unquote blood tonics like herbs that are high in iron that will build the hematocrit. These are herbs like dandelion, yellow dock, um, maybe burdock, nettles, and most of these herbs are very bitter and drying in energy. Now, blood itself is warm and moist in nature. Um, if we're going to do something drying and bitter to blood, we're actually going to make it worse. We're going to deplete it even further. So the only way those Western herbs work is if you combine it with molasses. And molasses builds blood. It nourishes blood. It's also high in energy and it's warm and moist. So if you're going to take a Western approach, absolutely have plenty of molasses in there. But you can also use some well-known Chinese herbs that are easy to find in the West now like Donggui which actually causes red blood cell proliferation. Lysi berries, goji berries, those are very easy to get in the stores now. Um, cooked Romani is a Chinese foxglove um, that's processed. White peony root, longanberries, sometimes called dragon eyes, and mulberries. So a lot of um, the darker berries uh, tonify blood. Now you might have both a pale, wide, and thin tongue. So you can have deficient blood and energy going on at the same time, in which case you combine herbs from both categories. No problem. Now this one is pale and thick. See how thick that tongue is? This is a very swollen tongue. It's filling the entire mouth. And um, it's actually a short tongue also. We'll see about short tongues later. But this is a um, this tongue is indicating there's so much coldness over time that it's caused um, slowed metabolism. So there's not enough metabolic heat. It's, it's like having a burner on low in a big pot of water you're trying to boil. It takes a long time. And it, it may never even come to a simmer. Um, depending on what you keep adding to that pot, if you keep putting in raw vegetables or a lot of salad or, or ice drinks or things that are cold, it will never come to a boil. So you eventually get undigested food in the stools because it will not fully break down. So this kind of swollen pale tongue means that there's coldness, not enough, uh, it's called deficient yang, so there's not enough heat to metabolize and um, the person will actually tend to feel cold, the urine will be clear, uh, to copious. Um, there could be loose stools, watery diarrhea, especially early in the morning. Um, the, the person might even look pale and frigid. Um, there could be impotence, infertility, nighttime urination, edema, so swelling in various parts of the body. And in this case, we need to warm the body up. We need to give stimulants or as it's called in Chinese medicine, warm the interior herbs. And then also yang tonics. So stimulants are things like black pepper, dried ginger, uh, garlic, um, cinnamon bark, 
and the major um, herb for this is aconite. And this is processed prepared aconite, not western aconite. These are all very hot herbs that warm the body and spark that yang. They help turn that burner up. Now we also have herbs that tonify the yang that actually have warming metabolizing energy in them. And teasel is one of them. Eucomia, rubber tree bark, ashwagandha, a lot of people are getting to know that Ayurvedic herb. Cordyceps, same thing for that Chinese herb. Damiana. Um, horny goat weed is also called um, epimidium, so a lot of people know that, and uh, fenugreek is a good one. So these are all yang tonics that could uh, potentially be used. Now we have a red tongue. Look at the difference between that one and this one. This one's a red tongue. It's darker red than pale red. And anytime you see red, think of heat. So heat in the body is completely opposite than coldness. Everything is moving too fast. Heat moves things with it. It moves the chi, it moves the blood, it, moves, it dries the fluids, and um, will move the tongue so somebody's more talkative. They're restless, they're fidgety, they can't sit straight in, the, in their seats. Um, they're throwing their clothes off because they're so hot. They sweat real easily. They have stronger body odors, tend more, more toward irritation, frustration, um, uh, red eyes, any kind of secretions, excretions tend to be yellow to red in color um, and there might be burning sensations as well and um, or red and swollen uh, like inflammations. Uh, that's all heat. So we want to give herbs that clear heat. Alteratives, anaphlogistics, anti-inflammatories, antitoxins. We have a lot of those herbs in Western medicine that are extremely effective. Dandelion root and leaves, red clover, golden seal, yellow dock gentian, all of these, turmeric, sweet violet. We have a ton of them. And this is uh, really one of the um, highlights of the Western pharmacopoeia, our herbs that clear in this way. Now you can have heat just in one part of the body and as you see here this is the complete anterior or front of the tongue. This is the lungs and the heart. So we would say that there's heat in the lungs and the heart. So what you do is you use herbs that clear heat specifically in the lungs and the heart. When you go to most herbals you'll find that um, they will indicate not just what herbs do but also that uh, where the energy of that herb goes and if they don't actually delineate it saying lungs and heart they'll say it treats pulmonary infections or it treats cardiac issues and then you know okay lungs and heart. Um, so if you use an herb that cleared heat in the intestines is that really going to help in the lungs and the heart? It might indirectly but not we want immediate uh, help in this case. Here we've got heat on the top sides of the tongue and the gallbladder. So again we're going to use herbs that clear heat directly from the gallbladder in this case. Now there's other types of ways of seeing heat. It's called raised papillae and if you look at the this lower left part of the tongue you can see how these are all raised from the body of the tongue. They actually kind of stick up. Um, easier to see over here on this left. So that includes, that is another sign of heat and this tongue is more on the red side and we call this wind heat. So it's a, it's a way of phrasing um, colds and flus, allergies, um, sinus infections. This is mostly, it's a little bit in the center of the tongue but it's mainly in the front third which is the lungs again. So the lungs relates to skin, there might be some skin conditions, itchy skin eruptions. Uh, sweaty, swollen sore throat, colds and flus, that sort of thing. So we want to use diaphoretics, but we want to use diaphoretics with a cooling energy. In other words, uh, we don't want ginger in this case because it's warm and we've got heat. So we want to use an herb like mint. Um, it could be peppermint, it could be um, lemon balm, uh, there are other, other mints that treat colds and flus and they have a cool energy and that's exactly what we want in this case. Elder also comes in this category, yarrow. Um, if you're familiar with the Chinese herb puaria, that's um, uh, the, the root of uh, kuzu root or kudzu root from the south um, 
southern United States that's unprocessed. Chrysanthemum flowers, bone set, fever few, and bluebloom is another Chinese Japanese herb that's used for uh, this these kind of external conditions. Now you can have a more extreme for form of heat that we call fire. So if the tongue is red and the papillae themselves are also red, then you've got a stronger heat. The stronger the heat, the more we call it fire. So somebody can have heat and if it's really red, like we saw the tongue with the anterior third back here, I'm going to show you this one again, that's more fire. So it's a really strong red. And in this case, we're going to use uh, stronger heat clearing herbs that are um, uh, internal as well. Now, the mints absolutely work again for this because it's more in the anterior portion. We have a little bit back here, a little bit back here. But we can also use turmeric, dandelion, gardenia, echinacea. These herbs all fit this category for, for clearing this kind of, of uh, heat. Now. You can have a tongue with raised red points, which is really like the papillae. And, um, but here it's all over the tongue. And um, the person is having, um, in this case, more internal heat and inflammation. So it's um, heat toxins, we call it. And these are toxins that are, tend to be in the blood or in the whole system. And this way we want to use antitoxin herbs, the herbs that clear heat and toxins. So dandelion, red clover, echinacea, burdock, honeysuckle, plantain, turmeric, asatis, bugleweed, all of these are great herbs to choose. They all have a cool to cold energy and they also clear toxins out of the body. Now here's a really red tongue. You want to talk about fire. This is what we would call a scarlet tongue. It's a deep red tongue body. And in fact, there's so much heat, it's starting to wither the tongue. See how it's all kind of getting wrinkled and withered? What happens when you have a lot of heat in the body is it starts drying up the fluids. Um, we know this because we get thirsty. We get very, very thirsty the hotter we get. And we profusely sweat, so we're losing even more body fluids. And the more uh, uh, fluids we lose, the more dehydrated we get. And it's going to affect the blood at some point as well. So the blood over time can even become um, deficient if this were to go on for a long period of time. So in this case, we want to use febrifuges, antiphlogistics, antipyretics. We want to use herbs that clear fire. They're cold herbs that are really going to clear fire. Gardenia, self-heal, which is prunella, pansy, uh, reedgrass, which is phragmites, and sweet violet are all really good choices in this category. So in extreme cases, yes, you can get delirium or, or a disturbed mind. It doesn't have to go that far, or even heat exhaustion. But um, uh, so it doesn't have to be acute. It could be chronic. But if, if somebody comes into you with this kind of tongue, they're probably going to have some more extreme symptoms. Now, this tongue looks pale, but it's also a little on the bluish side. See how it's kind of bluish in this whole area? And this is not the light. Look at the skin color. It's a good skin color. So you can even see the bluishness as compared to the skin color. Anytime you have a bluish or purplish discoloration, it's, we call it blood stasis. That means the blood is not circulating well. It's, um, it's getting stuck and it's slowed down. A blood stasis is like a traffic accident. It, you know it because when blood slows down and not circulating well, you can have fixed stabbing or boring pains. They're, they can be extremely painful. They don't move. They stay in the same location. It doesn't go away. It doesn't come and go. It just stays and it hurts. Um, it can also create hard, immobile masses and lumps or tumors. It can cause hemorrhaging over time or clots. Now, these kind of clots in the menstrual blood are going to be bigger than um, a, the size of a pea. And some people, some women even experience uh, bits of flesh. It looks like flesh passing through on their blood. The menses itself could be dark colored. Somebody with this kind of tongue, their complexion might be dark colored or certain parts of their face might look darker, bluish, purplish colored. The nails might be purplish. Um, and uh, there could be even tremors or swelling of the organs from blood stasis. So we want to use herbs that move blood. In the West, we call these amenagogues. In Chinese herbs, 
medicine, we call them herbs that regulate blood. And so angelica, safflower, myrrh, frankincense, motherwort, vervain, calendula, these are all really great herbs to use to um, move blood. And um, they also help stop the pain from blood stasis. So um, you really want to take these pretty quickly and um, sufficient quantities to get that blood moving. Here's another look at a bluish tongue and even a bluish green tongue that um, also indicates blood stagnation. And um, you can have blue and red together or purple and red together as in this tongue, in which case you have both blood stasis and heat. Look at how purple it is in the center of the tongue and more toward the rear of the tongue. And underneath this whole area, see, see all this purplishness? It's almost like you're seeing some veins. So um, that's all blood stasis. But the rest of the tongue is quite red. So you've got heat and blood stasis going on, in which case you combine both amenagogues and alteratives, antiphlogistics, antitoxin herbs, all of those together. And here's some examples I've already mentioned to you. Now you could have a, a tongue that's not purplish overall but has a purple spot. Look at this purple spot here on the edge. This is the liver. The edge right here is the liver. The top side here is the gallbladder. So this is really liver and gallbladder. Um, I'm trying to see just a hint of purple over here and here, not, um, but this is the major place. So you know that here it's mainly in the liver. Um, it's also the center of the tongue, so it could relate to the stomach and spleen as well, the organs in the middle part of the body. So you specifically want to use amenagogues again that go to the liver and potentially the spleen and the stomach. And I'll clue you in, pretty much all herbs that move blood go to the liver. So that's handy. Now here are those sublingual veins I was telling you about. Somebody touches the tip of their tongue to the roof of their mouth and you can see right here it's in the lower part of the body. So this is the tip, this is the heart and lungs, the whole front, and this is the rear of the body and then this would be the middle. So these are extending up into the middle. So we would call this blood stasis in the lower and middle parts of the body. And the thicker they are and the darker purple they are, the more extreme the blood stasis is. So again, you're going to use herbs that regulate blood, particularly in the middle and lower parts of the body. So take a quick peek right now at your tongue picture or with a mirror and look at your tongue. I'm going to kind of glance at your, any questions here and um, see if I can answer it. But, but look at your tongue. Is it normal in color or is it pale or red or purple? Uh, or is there sublingual blood stasis? And uh, get a good idea about that for yourself. Remember, don't stick it out for longer than 15 seconds. And there is a question here. When you look at someone's tongue, does it make a difference if they brush their tongue before being red? Good question. Um, I find that it doesn't. Most uh, Sometimes a coat on a tongue will be scraped off by using uh, a toothbrush or a tongue scraper, but not always. So if somebody has done it, you can actually ask them. When you look at their tongue, you can actually ask, have you scraped your tongue this morning? Because some people do it automatically as just part of their tongue brushing or their teeth brushing routine. Um, so that will help you know if it looks like there may be a little coat and you're wondering if, if maybe there shouldn't be a little bit more according to their symptoms that will tell you that they may have scraped some of it off. It will also tell you it's a loose coat. We're going to get into coats next and that it can be scraped off. Um, or if they say they brush their tongue and they never can get the coat off, then you know the coat is more rooted. Um, and that has its own indications as well. So. Um, Ideally, when somebody comes to see you, they don't brush their tongue, but if they do, don't worry about it. It's not failed. No problem. Um, and I'm going to see if we have any other questions I can answer right now.
Yes, you do have information access to the information after the webinar. Um, okay, you've somebody has seen heat or fire, a little deep red, while the patient was cold all the time. So yes, sometimes what ha what you can have coldness and heat coexisting. You can have any of these things coexisting. Um, in which case you combine the herbs. So you warm the person up and you also clear heat. So you're going to see heat in one part of the tongue, you clear heat in that part. Wherever the coldness is in the other part of the tongue, you use herbs that go to those organs to clear the cold. Now sometimes coldness can transform into heat over time, especially if there's stagnation. So usually there'll be um, uh, a coat to see, let's see, um, you saying there's no tongue, there's no cracks, and it's not peeled. Okay. Yes. You use less heat clearing and a little bit more warming herbs. Now, you wouldn't use hot herbs. You'd use herbs that are more um, warming and moving. Um, and again, going to those particular organs. So I'm going to see. Um, you're asking about using tinctures or teas, um, whatever you can get the patient to take. If somebody has a lot of heat, I don't always recommend tinctures because they're um, being made from alcohol, they're heating in nature. Uh, but if they're made of cooling herbs, then that would be fine. The herbs would counteract that. Um, sometimes you just have to give somebody whatever they'll take. Otherwise, they won't take it and won't work. Um, yeah, lemons and so forth, unless a person has a reaction to it, uh, ideally you look at the tongue no closer than a half hour or an hour after somebody's eaten. So that would take care of any food reactions. Um, what is the line in the center, tip of tongue and center? Oh, that must have been about a particular slide. Sorry, I'm not there anymore. Um, okay, if you have heatness and dryness, you clear heat and you use moistening herbs. You can use cooling moistening herbs. Marshmallows are a really good one in this case because um, it's cooling and moistening and anti-inflammatory. Okay, so I think that's good for now. You've all looked at your tongues. You've got a good idea of what's going on. I'll look at more questions later, take more questions later. But let's move on to the tongue coat. So the tongue coat, as I said before, shows the state of the yang organs. These are the less vital or hollow organs of the body, the location of the disharmony, and um, more acute pathologies, although of course it's present during chronic illness as well. And it's going to indicate excess or deficient states and the overall state of dampness or dryness in the body. So we can have a thin white coat. And a thin white coat can be completely normal. See how you see most of the tongue body through the coat? It's so uh, thin that you hardly even know that there's a coat there. Um, and white coats, quite often, you can't always see that there's a coat there, if, especially if it's thin. So it could be normal. If it's not normal, in other words, if people, somebody's having symptoms and so forth, typically it means either there's coldness in the body or there's uh, an invasion of what we call wind chill. So in other words, it's a cold or flu due to coldness, in which case the person's going to be shivering, have higher chills, lower fever. Um, runny nose, no sweating, no body odors, dull headache, um, they might have a sore throat but it's going to be very dull, they might be sneezing, body aches, that kind of thing. Um, they want to be covered up all the time. Or if they have internal coldness then it's a lot of the things we talked about earlier with coldness, the loose stools, no, no appetite, clear urination, uh, and so forth. So if we have um, wind chill, we want to use uh, warming diaphoretics. And warming diaphoretics are herbs that cause a sweat and um, uh, but have a warm energy. So here's where you use fresh ginger. You don't want to use mint or elder. They're, they're cooling. We want to use warming herbs. So fresh ginger, osha, lovage, angelica, scallion, sage, hyssop, these are all um, good herbs to use in this case. 
uh, oops, I went the wrong direction. So here we have a thicker white coat. See how it's thicker where you, in some places you don't even see the tongue very well through the coat because it's thicker. So the thicker the, the white coat, that means there's not, the energy in the body is not as strong because it's not metabolizing fluids as well. And they're starting to collect in the body and in this case collect on the tongue as well. So we call that dampness. It's starting to create some dampness in the body. And these are signs, again, a lot of these are signs of, of insufficient energy in the body. But you also have, if there's dampness, feelings of heaviness. Um, the arms and legs especially might feel heavy. If, if there's heaviness there, there might be edema or swelling in the arms or legs. There could be heaviness, a feeling of heaviness in the abdomen, and the abdomen might may or may not be swollen feeling of heaviness in the head, in which case you'd have more of a stuffy nose or chronic runny nose uh, and that sort of thing. So here we want to use herbs that help get rid of dampness. We want to tonify chi. We want to help provide the body more energy to metabolize. Diuretics that help shed fluids, um, especially if there's edema and swelling. And stomachics, herbs that help digestion. So we can really metabolize food and fluids and the, um, prevent the dampness from collecting. Here are all possibilities, Tanifai Chi, Reishi, Eleuthero, Astragalus and so forth. Some of these uh, we had before. Uh, diuretics, you could use Fu Ling, Chinese herb, Poria, Cocos or Hoelan is another herb for that, name for that herb, uh, or nettles. And stomachics are, they're aromatic herbs that uh, help digestion, so clove, patchouli, uh, cardamom. These are all herbs in that category. Now, see the see the difference? White coat, yellow coat. White coat, yellow coat. I'm showing you this because sometimes a yellow coat is not so obvious as it is here. And um, if it's not white, it's probably yellow is what uh, the conclusion I've come to uh, in those cases. But this one's very obviously yellow and it's a thicker yellow coat. So yellow means heat. So we've got heat and if it's a, a yellow coat like this, especially thicker, there's more dampness. So there's dampness and heat. We'll call this, we call this damp heat. So again, there could be feelings of heaviness, but there could be a bitter taste in the mouth because of that heat in the body. The person might be thirsty because of the heat, but because there's dampness, they only want to drink in small sips. The urine might be scanty because of the heat, but it's going to tend to be dark yellow and possibly with burning. There could be a yellow vaginal discharge and itching and odor and the stool would have a stronger odor. These are all some of the signs of damp heat. In this case, we want to use the typical Western, what we call bitter tonic herbs. These are all herbs that are cooling in energy and bitter in taste and they dry damp heat. We have a lot of these in the Western Materia Medica. It's fabulous. All of the yellows are in this category. All the berberine herbs, golden seal, barberry, yellow dock, gentian, chaparral, coptis uh, Chinese herb, and then greater celandine also is a good one. So these are the kind of herbs you take if there's damp heat in the body. Um, rather than that earlier case we talked about with um, deficient blood. And this is a really thick yellow coat. Um, the thicker the coat you have, and this is so thick you can't see the tongue through it at all. It could be white or yellow. When it gets this thick, we say that there's also food stagnation in the body. In other words, food is not being fully digested and metabolized. So it's starting to collect in the body. In Ayurvedic medicine, we call this ama. And it becomes a toxic substance that prevents and blocks the flow of chi blood and fluids. So as you can imagine, it sets up all kinds of uh, health potential health problems. There will be more pronounced symptoms of heaviness and you can see this tongue's a bit on the swollen side as well. So that's also reflecting in terms of the tongue body, the um, um, dampness that's collecting in the body. A lot of the same uh, symptoms we talked about but when you have a thicker coat you tend to have things like cysts or, or uh, nodules form. 
and they may be internal, might be fibroids or cysts, it might be um, in the channels um, undetected, uh, which could eventually block the flow and create um, arthritic, rheumatic issues, or uh, even tremors. Um, so not our friend, not what we want to have. Here we definitely want to use those bitter tonics again and possibly expectorants, especially the more we see in the upper part of the body, in the lung area, we can use expectorants. They can also help us dissolve this, this what we call hot phlegm or phlegm with heat. So phlegm is when dampness has consolidated and condensed. And it's condensed because it's not circulating. And if there's heat, it's drying the fluids. So it's condensing even further. So we need some digestive herbs to help move that food stagnation. These are things like hawthorn berries and radish seeds, sprouted rice or barley. Sprouted barley could be in this category too. Or expectorants with a cool energy, cooling expectorants. Loquat, whorehound, mullen, elderberry, these sorts of herbs all clear um, phlegm that has uh, that's heat as well. Now it's possible to get a brown or black coat on the tongue, um, so, or even a gray coat. This is kind of startling. I've only seen this maybe twice in over 30 years, 33 years. Um, and it means that there's either extreme heat or cold. When I first saw this, it was a woman who had um, what we call lack of fluids in the body or deficient yin. I'm going to show you that tongue pretty soon here. And so there's not enough fluids in the body. Uh, she's experiencing dryness and so forth. And she started having what were probably food poisoning um, symptoms. And she thought she needed to cleanse her intestines, so she took golden seal. Now, golden seal is very bitter and dry. It's one of those bitter tonics we talked about earlier. And it dries fluids and blood. So she actually caused a more extreme condition of her uh, situation of deficient fluids. And she came in with a black coat on her tongue. So this can be cleared. This can be treated. Um, here we have long-standing heat because the tongue is red. And it's getting more narrow toward the tip. See how it's more narrow here? The more narrow a tongue gets, the more the heat is consuming fluids. So it should be rounded out all the way around, and it's not. So um, here we have a more extreme heat that's going on. And um, if you have that, then you, of course, need alteratives, anti-inflammatories, anti-phlogistics, that sorts of things. If you have extreme cold, which we don't hear, You'd be using the stimulants and tonify yang herbs. Now here's a sign of heat consuming body fluids. You see how dry this coat is? You can almost see individual flakes of the coat and it's quite dry. So the heat is starting to dry this up and that means it's drying up the fluids in the body too. And see how we have, we've got some raised papillae here and it's all red and how the tongue is red here. So that's why we're saying here we've got heat consuming the body fluids. And in time this could become what we call fire or extreme heat. So you want to use those good old herbs that are cold or cool in energy and that um, are either clear damp heat or toxins or um, um, cool the body down, febrifuges. Um, so dandelion, gardenia, self-heal, pansy, all these great herbs. Baptisia is another good one, borage. They have that um, really good co cold or cool energy to cool the body down. Here is a wet coat, and it's just not the shininess from the light. But see how wet it is? It's very moist. Some people actually can drip. Their tongue can drip. Or you'll see frothy, a frothy coat or bubbles on the tongue. That means there's dampness. And of course, dampness arises from an accumulation of fluids, too many fluids in the body. And usually, that occurs because there's not enough energy to metabolize the fluids. Um, you can tell because when you ask them what they eat or drink, if they're drinking a lot of cold fluids, eating a lot of cold food directly out of the refrigerator, drinking a lot of milk, so forth. Um, or a lot of yogurt, this will create a, a, quite a bit of dampness 
in the body and you'll see it showing up on the tongue. Or the person might be having those feelings of heaviness, loose stools, oozing skin eruptions, edema, um, heavy stiff joints, nausea. These are all signs of dampness. So here we want to use both the category of verbs diuretics as well as aromatics stomachics. We've talked about both of these before. So dandelion leaf, cleavers, fooling, or that hoellen are really great diuretics. And then cardamom, patchouli, magnolia bark, uh, cloves or other um, aromatic stomachics that dry that dampness um, very quickly, actually. Now here's a slippery wet coat. You see how it's, see how slippery that is? I talked about how it could become frothy and that these are um, examples of that. So here we've got dampness and food stagnation. Uh, similar to that yellow thick coat we had earlier where we said there was food stagnation. So uh, symptoms somebody might have is fullness in the stomach, the, the upper stomach area, the epigastric area around that area. Sour regurgitation, potentially, no appetite, nausea, foul breath, belching, fullness and distension, also of the epigastrium. We want to use, again, diuretics, stomachics, and digestives. So in Chinese medicine, hawthorn berries are digestive. It really helps to digest meat and fats. So a uh, good choice for this, sprouted rice, radish seeds, and the diuretics and stomachics we've talked about before. This is a sticky coat. Um, a sticky coat is a coat that can't be scratched off, so it's got a lot of fine flakes to it. And here we've got phlegm and fluids collecting in the body. This one is white, so there's cold and phlegm. And uh, so we're going to need to really not only um, use diuretics and expectorants, but also stomachics to um, get rid of the uh, the dampness that's collected in the middle, see how thick it is in the middle part of the body, uh, in the stomach region. And um, uh, potentially some, uh, expect some uh, yeah, expectorants. So um, elecampane is a very good choice because it works both on the spleen, stomach, and the lungs, while cherry bark might be a, an example or thyme on stomachics we just covered. So. Um, when it's thicker like this, you can't scrape it off with a tongue scraper, no matter what. You've got these phlegm fluids that have collected. Now you can have a creamy or greasy coat. This looks like it's lying a little bit more on the coat, but it means very similar. It's accumulation of cold dampness and food stagnation, even though the tongue is red. So the tongue is red, there's heat. And um, uh, this coat to me looks just a tad yellow, um, so, but you've got a lot of heat, so you're going to have to be careful at what kind of stimulants you use. Um, you need to get rid of this phlegm though, and um, it will depend on the symptoms somebody has. If they're feeling cold and a desire for warm food and drinks, you know that there's coldness. Sometimes internal coldness can actually um, appear a little bit as heat, but this whole tongue body being so red, we've got to take care of that. So I would be using heat clearing herbs at the same time. Now sometimes you have a greasy white coat becoming a yellow coat. You can actually see the coldness transforming into the heat and this happens over time. Remember anytime you have dampness it's accumulating and it's not circulating. It's like a big downpour outside. It's raining really hard or a monsoon and flooding happens and when you have flooding cars have to slow or stop. They can't move through it nearly so quickly or easily and it's the same thing in the body. The, the energy of the body, the blood, and the fluids all get slowed down when you have dampness accumulating and then it starts to fester like a pond that's stagnating and not circulating. It festers and bacteria begins to grow in it and so in this case heat begins to grow. So you can have um, signs of damp heat begin to occur as I've got listed over here where you have the feelings of heaviness um, which is dampness. Now nausea, bitter taste, signs of heat. Desire to drink only in so small sips, signs of heat. Scanty dark urine, signs of heat. 
burning, signs of heat. So um, in this case, we want to treat it like a heat condition and uh, clear the damp heat with the bitter tonics. Now you can have a tofu-like coat. It almost looks like, like chunks of tofu or cottage cheese on the tongue. See all this? This is really um, not only extreme damp heat, but food stagnation and phlegm heat all at the same time. Sometimes you see this in people with candida. You'll see this kind of tofu-like coat where there's just this huge amount of dampness that's accumulated. So there's these big rough-grained flakes that are lying on the tongue. Uh, versus the very fine ones. And that's what forms this kind of cottage cheesy or soy cheese look to the tongue. So you need bitter tonics and digestives here. We absolutely need to clear damp heat and move that food stagnation. Now, another very important coat is what we call the peeled coat. You see, in this case, we have a coat on the tongue, but we also have peeled areas on the tongue where there's no coat. It looks like somebody took the, the, the um, um, tongue itself and uh, the layer of it and just peeled it back and off like you might some skin. And there's quite a bit of peeled areas here. All of this area, this whole front area looks peeled. A little bit here. So a peeled coat means that there's a lack of fluids in the body. If every if this tongue had all of this on it, then um, this thicker white coat, then there'd be a little bit of dampness in the body. But instead, it's peeled, so we're lacking fluids. We call this deficient yin, where there's a lack of moisture in the body. And a lack of moisture or deficient yin has very particular symptoms associated with it. The person gets hot in the late afternoon, evening, or nighttime. Not during the day, but when it starts getting dark outside, we have the yin time of day coming in when yin should be abundant and flourishing. It's like you, you get a little bit of dew on the grass, the moisture in the air. And instead, we're lacking it, so we feel hotter during these times. Uh, women in menopause know this very well with night sweats or their hot flashes might get worse then. But it doesn't matter if you're male or female or what your age is. You can actually, if you have this tongue, you can actually have feelings of heat in the late afternoon or evening or night sweats. Also, malar flush, where the cheeks are burning or red. Not the whole face or neck, but just the cheeks are burning and red. There might be a sensation of burning in the soles of the feet and uh, palms of the hands and or the chest. It might be a, just one of those or a combination of those. I've even had people come in to me and say they feel like they're standing on something hot and they move their foot and there's nothing. There's nothing hot there at all. They're just standing on regular concrete. But they're having the burning sensation in their foot. That's a sign of this lack of, of body fluids. Um, that's occurring. The, the sleep is sort of a restless floating sleep. The throat is dry at night. There is more thirst, particularly at night. There can be more agitation or restlessness, uh, particularly mental restlessness. The cough is dry. The stools are dry. The, the urine is scanty. So these are all signs of lack of body fluids. In this case, we need to clear the heat because these are all signs of heat, but they're not a full heat. It's more a heat similar to running your engine dry on fluids. You've run it out of oil or any other kind of lubricant that's needed for the engine, and the engine starts burning out. It's very similar in the body. Not enough fluids in the body. The body begins to burn out. And sometimes we call it burnout. I feel burnt out. We're burning the candle at both ends. And you start getting these symptoms. So we need cooling herbs, yes, but we need cooling and moistening herbs. We need to actually supplement the fluids in the body. So here we use demulcents, things like slippery elm and marshmallow. They're both cooling, um, but they're moistening also. Or we can use the mulcent febrifuges. These are herbs that, are, that clear heat or higher heat. Figwort, uh, scrofularia, um, comes under this category. And in Chinese medicine, we have a category of herbs called yin tonics. These are herbs that actually tonify body fluids, that build body fluids, and um, strengthen the organ function at the same time. So Japanese turf lily is one of them. It's ophiopogon. Um, sometimes it's called mondo grass. It's an ornamental sold in a lot of um, 
uh, nurseries. Shatavari, this is Ayurvedic um, uh, form of uh, wild asparagus root or Chinese asparagus root, both of which are not the same as Western regular grow and eat asparagus root. So don't use that. Privet berries, eclipta and turtle shell, these are all really great herbs that treat this peeled coat. Now you can also have a peeled coat with thorns and you can see them here in the back. And when you start having thorns, remember thorns um, or raised papillae we would see in the front of the tongue in past pictures? That means heat. So in this case we not only have this peeled coat, which you can just kind of see where it got peeled off right here all of this and it's red underneath we have these thorns so there's more extreme heat which again we call fire so in this case we not only have yin deficiency but fire as well and we need to really clear this heat nourish the yin and target the kidney area because remember the kidneys are in this lower part of the body here so um, a lot of those herbs I just mentioned to you are very appropriate for doing just that. And these are the symptoms. Um, not only would you have some of those um, deficient yin symptoms or lack of body fluid symptoms, but you could have tinnitus, and this is sort of a whooshing sound in the ears. The bone, you can have an ache in the bone. You might even have what's called steaming bone, where it feels like steam is floating up from deep in the bones toward the surface of the skin. A uh, low sperm count, weak sore back. These are um, a lot of these are signs of the kidneys, uh, deficient kidneys. Okay, so take out your tongue picture again, uh, your tongue photo, your mirror, and your flashlight, and look at your the coat on your tongue and examine the color of the coat, the thinness or the thickness of the coat. Is the coat damp, dry, greasy, sticky, wet, slippery, tofu-like? Or do you have the presence of a peeled coat? And while you're looking at your tongue, I'm going to go through some of your questions again. And um, somebody wants to know how to access the webinar materials. If you signed up for the webinar, then you will be sent, uh, you should be sent, I believe, an email that will give you a link to it. Um, can someone with food stagnation or hot phlegm show signs of acid reflux? Absolutely. When you have food stagnation or even dampness that's collecting and accumulating in the stomach region, it slows down, again, the circulation of energy and it can make things go up instead of down. When we digest food, it's supposed to go down to the intestines and get absorbed or sent out as uh, dross. In this case, energy is going up. So you can get acid reflux. Um, uh, somebody has some cracks in the tongue. Okay, so cracks in general is part of body shape, which is going to be in part two. But I'll let you know that cracks mean a depletion of body fluids. So it's the beginning of, of a deficiency of the yin that we were just talking about, like the peeled tongue coat. And you may or may not have peel, uh, a peeled tongue coat. So somebody was asking about the herbs for kidney fire, and I'm going to put them on right here while you're looking at your tongues. Um, you have questions? Keep sending them my way. What do you have? A, a wet tongue with a white coat, but peeled in the rear. Oh, this is a fun combination because you have dampness and coldness from the white coat and the wet coat, so the wet coat means there's dampness, the white coat means there's coldness, possibly chi deficiency, but in the rear of the tongue where it's peeled, you have kidney yin deficiency. And absolutely, you can have this combination. And it's a, trickier to treat as well, you can imagine, because herbs that clear dampness are going to dry the body fluids for the kidneys, and herbs that moisten the body fluids for the kidneys are going to create more dampness in the spleen. Um, what's basically happening is the spleen metabolism, um, and I'm backing up for a second, spleen and stomach are a partnered unit in Chinese medicine and they're both in charge of proper digestion and transformation of food and fluids, so metabolism. So if you have accumulation in fluids affecting your digestion, you're going to show the accumulation of fluids and you're not going to be digesting and assimilating well so those um, 
uh, you're not going to be sending nutrients to the kidneys um, in this case, and so they're going to be showing deficiency. So what you want to do is um, have some chi tonic herbs that are going to strengthen the energy and the metabolizing power of, um, of the fluids that are present. You use a milder diuretic that can get uh, help get rid of the fluids there. Um, you could use maybe a little bit of, say, um, uh, cardamom, maybe just a pinch, really a very tiny amount. But I would focus more on diuretics and um, chi tonics. And then you could add in a little bit of herb that nourishes the, the fluids in the kidney area, like shatavari, um, Chinese asparagus root, um, turtle shell, but um, you'd have them all in ratio and balance with one another to make sure you're digesting it and it doesn't create more dampness. So great questions coming my way and I think that's pretty much what I'm going to take now. We have 15 minutes so let's focus on questions. Um, what do you do if a person has lots of damp signs but also a dry mouth at night? Ah, this definitely happens because again, dampness is collecting, accumulating, and not flowing in other areas. You can get that cottony mouth. So if it's dry, particularly at night, then you're getting a little bit in the category that somebody was just asking me about having dampness and white uh, on the coat and yet a peeled root. So I would do the same thing. I would be using um, chi tonics and um, along with herbs that um, uh, clear the dampness, but that also um, nourish the yin a little bit. And um, diet is so key here because people who are eating a lot of damp foods can create this problem right away. And what are damp foods? Flour products, all flour products. Doesn't matter if it's whole grain, stone ground, organic, what it is, it's flour and water, and flour and water make paste. Dairy, very dampening. Doesn't matter if it's the best yogurt in the world, it's very dampening. Anything cold, so anything eaten directly out of the refrigerator, ice drinks, cold milk, juice, um, it's cold and it douses digestive fires and creates dampness. Raw foods, too many raw foods create dampness. So um, you want a diet that's more warming and metabolizing cooked food, um, some spices with food, and um, that's going to help take care of um, some of those signs as well. Drinking water can help disperse the dampness to a certain extent and um, uh, take care of that. Okay. Um, have I ever seen the combination of a green and yellow tongue? Um, so you're talking about sort of that blue-green tongue, like the blood stasis with the yellow coat? Yes, that's very possible. I'm assuming that, that that's what you mean. Um, I've never seen a green coat. Um, if you're thinking of a green-yellow coat, it's probably the light, so the yellow coat looks greenish. I would treat it like a yellow coat. Um, if you have a mix of heat, cold dots, peeling redness, and white coat, where do you start? So a lot of you are, are um, having this combination of cold and heat. And you know what? This is the real world. I just jump for joy when somebody comes in and it's a clear, pale, cold, swollen tongue. It's so clear because you know exactly what to do. But typically, and most often, you have combinations of things. So yes, you combine herbs for them. Where is the peeling redness? Where are where is the white coat? You know, which organs are involved? So um, what's the predominance? If you've got both going on, is there a little bit of white coat and a lot of peeling or a lot of white coat and a tiny bit of peeling? That will show you the ratio of the two together and which to focus on the most. Um, your coat has a min your tongue has a minimal coat, some blue and purple with a crack going down the center. Okay, so minimal coat. Uh, you didn't say what the color was. Let's assume it was a thin white coat, which is normal. So we're not going to consider the coat in this case. But you've got some blue and purple. 
Definitely, absolutely, we want to pay attention to blood stasis. You want to be using amenagogues, herbs that regulate blood, get that blood moving, that's important. A crack down the center can mean several things. If it's down the center of the tongue, in the center center of the tongue, then there means that means that there's deficient energy in the spleen and the stomach. So you want to use some spleen, ch stomach, chi tonics. If the crack goes all the way toward the tip, that means there's some constitutional heart weakness, which may or may not show up symptomatically. And again, that's in part two. I'm going to be wetting your tongue, so to speak, to attend part two of this webinar, which will be sometime in the fall, probably the early fall. Um, what if the tongue is very firm and hard to see, but definitely not peeled? Um, oh, it's very thin. So the tongue coat is very thin, hard to see, but the, then that's normal. So, okay, if the tongue coat is thin, hard to see, and but not peeled, then that could be normal. But if it's wet and shiny, then that means that you're starting to have some dampness. It's not a severe condition, um, just something that you want to start paying attention to. I would start with diet and maybe some chi tonics, and you should be fine. Now, if you have a damp, frothy tongue, that's a lot of dampness. And the frothier it is, it's probably um, uh, uh, tends more toward um, white. Uh, I've never seen yellow frothy because if it's yellow, there's heat and it's drying the fluids. So that's some cold dampness. And sometimes if it's in the top sides like this, it could be in the lungs. Or if it's in if it's in the lung area, it could be in the lungs or the sinuses, uh, allergies, chronic sinus infections, it can show up there. If it's in this area, it could be um, a lot of cold dampness in the digestive area. But um, you're, it's dry and some burning soles of the feet at night. So there's this combination of deficient fluids in some parts of the body, but too many fluids in another. So where do you have the damp frothy? And make sure there's no peeled area in the rear of the tongue. That's, so you want to look a little further. And again, you treat it by combining herbs. Um, Uh, more questions. Uh, meaning of a thick coat at the rear of the tongue. That's damp heat and potentially uh, food stagnation in the intestines. So um, could be large intestines, small intestines. There probably is a tendency toward either constipation or um, loose stools that are uh, have a lot of odor and and color to them, yellowish color to them. Um, now remember, if you've got a thick coat in the rear of the tongue, we're talking the thicker it is, the more fluids there are congealing. A yin deficient tongue means there's not enough fluids. So you're not going to have both in the same place. You can have a thick coat and red spots both in the rear of the tongue. The red spots means there's heat. So this tongue, this, this tongue has a yellow coat in the center and red spots in the rear. But look at a tongue that's not peeled and it can have a yellow coat in the rear and red spots. So the red spots are going to mean uh, either heat in the blood or toxic heat as well as the damp heat. So you want to use anti-toxin um, herbs, heat toxin herbs like um, dandelion, echinacea, um, red clover, as well as damp heat herbs, which would be barberry, Oregon grape, turmeric, um, those kind of herbs, those bitters. Spots on the tongue considered normal if they are not raised and the body of the tongue looks normal. Um, if they're red spots, um, then that's heat. And it's heat, it's probably a toxic heat. So non-raised red spots would be a toxic heat. I've never seen white spots, actually. Um, all, unless it's a wart, sometimes there's warts on the tongue, and um, and that would be that would be different. That would uh, a lot of times warts uh, form from heat, congealing fluids, so it's like almost this little cyst from that. A tongue with a white coat swollen and very deep scalloping. Oh, perfect example of a coat of deficient chi 
not transforming the fluids and the fluids accumulating. So in this case, you absolutely need those chi tonic herbs, Chinese ginseng, Chinese wild yam, um, uh, astragalus, uh, tractolotus, cottonopsis, along with herbs that get rid of dampness in that area. And I would include cloves, cardamom, uh, maybe a little hawthorn berry for um, probably some food stagnation if it's a thicker coat. So the scalloping means that the tongue is swelling from the fluids and so you're getting teeth indentations on the side and that's a bigger sign of not enough energy transforming the fluids. You see what looks like a blue coat in the center back of your tongue. Um, it, yeah, I've never seen a blue coat. Black, brown, gray, not blue. Um, it could be the lighting. It could be from something that you ate um, a while back that colored your tongue. Um, but if you think it's red, purple, then that definitely would be heat with blood stasis. Um, uh, you have a thin white clear coat, that's fine, but red like fire heat, tip of the tongue, and the center line is fire red. Okay, so center line, I don't know if, if it's center line here, it would be stomach fire. If it's center line here in the front, it's going to be um, lung fire. If, it's, uh, if the line is closer to the tip, then it's going to be heart fire. But you say definitely there's redness at the tip of the tongue. Redness at the tip of the tongue is either heart fire and sometimes it can mean depression or emotional issues. Um, there may not even be any physical symptoms. It could just be long-term unresolved emotional issues. So you all are asking me questions about uh, tongue shape and there's a lot more that we haven't covered that we will get into. Wetting your appetite again. Um, Susie says sometimes a frothy tongue can mean dehydration they haven't been drinking enough fluids. Um, sometimes that can happen. What I would do if there's no other obvious um, cause like the tongue is not real swollen, it's not thick, white and frothy, it's just plain frothy, I would have the person drink more fluids and see if that took that away. Because again sometimes to get rid of that dampness you have to moisten it to help it uh, disperse. And then um, possibly a little chi uh, tonic as well. Okay, if there are any stones present, what should be expected on the tongue? Typically stones um, indicate damp heat. So you'll probably gallbladder, you probably have damp, you have a yellow coat on the top side of the tongue, you might have it in the middle as well or the rear. Um, if the stone in the kidney is from fire, you're going to have more exactly this kind of coat potentially, a peeled coat um, or be redder with thorns in the rear of the tongue. Um, damp with food stagnation, what should be included in the diet? Uh, more drying foods, so grains are more drying, protein is more drying, cooked vegetables, um, those are all more drying balanced foods. That's what I would do, but it's not just what include, it's also what exclude, which I know I already talked about. You got lots of great questions here. Medium sized raised red nodes at the very rear of the tongue. Sometimes those mean yin deficiency. You don't see them here, but you can have raised red nodes in the rear here. Um, I would want to know more about the rest of the tongue and also the signs and symptoms to determine if it really is a lack of body fluids. If it's in somebody who tends to burn out, that's probably that deficient fluids. Red spots, red tongue body, yellow coat, heat, heat, heat. Um, what are the differences between them? You know, um, it, it, red tongue body means heat, yellow coat means heat and tending toward damp heat, so that could be the difference between them. Um, heat would be just more alteratives, you know, heat clearing herbs. Uh, yellow coat, damp heat, now we've got the bitter tonics we need, red spots. If they are indicating that wind heat we talked about, you need diaphoretics. So if they're showing more itchy skin eruptions, um, uh, sore throat, um, sinus stuff, allergy stuff, or cold flu stuff, then that's the wind heat. You need cooling diaphoretics. If, they're, if they don't have an acute condition and or the red spots are around the whole tongue, 
then it could meet toxic heat, in which you, case you need an antitoxin herb like echinacea, um, dandelion, or you need um, um, uh, an herb that clears heat out of the blood level itself. Um, and oh, that would be more the uh, demulcent febrifuge potentially could do that. I don't know of Western herbs that clear heat out of the blood so much. Um, we think of red clover and those kind of herbs, but they're bitter. So I would combine that with a demulcent at the same time. Okay, coming down to um, last five minutes, red spots in the rear of the tongue. Um, it depends on how far the rear is because the you know the very far rear is more kidneys um, you get into this kind of the rear um, and you're talking intestines it could be bladder um, it could be um, small intestine or large intestine it could be uterus so um, again whatever somebody's symptoms and signs are at that point you will be able to zero in on exactly you you see the heat in the lower part of the body you know it's there and depending on what they've got going, you can zero in more on the organs. But frankly, anytime you use an herb that's going to go to the intestines, the uterus, the bladder, uh, is also going to, and the kidneys is treating the lower part of the body. Um, okay, so a tongue is dry in the rear but moist at the tip, so there might be more moisture collecting in the upper part of the body and more dryness of body fluids in the kidneys or the intestines. Um, which books are best for quick reference of herbs uh, with direction to organs? Oh, I love that question because Michael's uh, Way of Herbs absolutely does that. My book, Healing with the Herbs of Life, does that. Um, uh, any Chinese Materia Medica is going to automatically tell you what organs and meridians the herbs go to. Um, Ayurvedic books delineate which organs herbs go to. So there are a lot of books out there and many of them you can actually purchase from our school. So you can go online on our website and go to the store and find those books. Um, is the stomach near the intestine and the spleen near the lung? Well, um, yeah, one would think so, but not necessarily. Um, this this whole area is considered the stomach spleen, and this in the middle is sometimes considered more just the stomach, and if you have cracks on the sides, it's considered more the spleen. Um, a lot of times when if there's stomach heat there's intestinal heat for other reasons of pairing and partnering um, you're talking about two yang organs versus the spleen and the lung two yin organs that have uh, direct relationships and influences on each other books for learning just gave you that you're loving my healing with the herbs of life thank you I'm so glad that you like that um, are there any other questions I have missed uh, this is great. We're finishing right on time. Crack on the tongue running back to front but also sideways from the center. So those are cracks front to back depending on how deep it is. Sometimes I've seen a whole trough in the center here and that's really deep in digestive impairment. Um, I mean it looks like you could run a bowling ball down this alley here for some people and that's extreme deficient chi at that point. Um, metabolic energy is very low but you can have cracks go off to the sides also so you're having a depletion of body, uh, body fluids occur at the same time. So um, I think I have answered all of your questions. Oh this is perfect. So I just want to let you all know again um, that we're taping this and going to have a link to it so you can go over this at your own rate and pace. Um, I'm going to be doing part two in the fall where we're going to get into the nitty-gritty about cracks and narrow tongues and short tongues and long tongues and um, different tip shapes and curled under tips and curled up tips and curled sides and um, cracks and all that good stuff. So, uh, And then also deviated tongues and things like that. We'll get into um, 
uh, and it will probably be in the um, September is what I'm thinking about right now, so in the fall. In the meantime, I encourage all of you take pictures of tongues, look at a lot of tongues, really focus in on the tongue body and the tongue coat because they are the most important. And get familiar with the areas of the tongue, where the organs are, where, where the coat is. It's not just the coat itself, but where is it? Because remember, it's indicating a particular pathology in a particular location. And um, the same thing about a peeled coat or um, shiny, wet, thick coats um, or just the color of the tongue, different colors, the purple, look at the sublingual veins underneath. Really become familiar with all of that and you'll just be amazed at how much it helps you. And you can actually see tongues on um, TV and in movies. I'm diagnosing tongues all the time that way. <laughs> so that can be really fun and um, give you a lot more experience. So. Um, when you see people talking, you'll notice their tongues quite a bit, and you'll just start getting insight about what's, what problems they have or what they might develop or what herbs you might start putting together to help them. And definitely try putting together a formula for yourself and what you noticed on your own tongue and see how it affects you, see how your tongue changes, tweak it if you need to. Um, to put a little bit more of this or a little less of that or add something else to it and until you get your tongue back to that really nice um, light red pale uh, or, or pink pale red um, very thin white coat normal looking tongue. So um, I wish you all the best in your tongue diagnosis forays this summer and I look forward to you at our next webinar. Take care everyone. Good night.